All right, so we have finally reached the lesson on recursion. This is going to be a fun and very challenging lesson. Recursion was perhaps the technical concept that I hated the most when I was learning how to program. And to be honest, I'm still not that great at it because it really is a challenging idea in programming. Recursion forces our brains to think in multiple dimensions, to keep track of multiple operations running at the exact same time. I even debated whether this was the right place in the course to introduce this lesson, but I figured I wanted you to get a taste of some of the real complexities of programming as early on as possible. Now, it's not necessarily a requirement that you're gonna be using recursion a lot in your personal code or even that you'll need to use it, but I want to make sure that you know what it is because it's a topic that comes up very frequently in things like interview questions, okay? So what is recursion? It's a pretty simple idea to describe, but a very difficult idea many times to implement in action. Recursion is when a function calls itself. Okay, let me repeat that. Recursion is when a function that we build calls itself within its own body. So first of all, you might be thinking, number one, what do you mean? And number two, how is this possible? Well, it is possible. Before we even finish defining the body of a function, we can actually go ahead and invoke that exact same function within the body or the block of the function that we are currently defining. If you think about it, we can invoke any other function within the body of a function, right? We've written plenty of code in this, in this class, in this course, where we have defined our own custom function and invoked another function like print or len within the body. It's the exact same idea, except we can invoke the function that we are currently inside in, right? We can invoke ourselves. And the next question you might have is, well, why would we ever want to do that? The answer to that is sometimes there are certain problems and certain scenarios where that actually represents the easiest way to solve the current problem. You're going to see a challenge in the next lesson that's going to ask you to find the factorial of a number, and that is a perfect example of where the recursive approach to solving a problem is actually the most elegant. It's also just unfortunately the most complex because, again, you have to think in multiple dimensions. You're going to have to keep track of multiple function executions going on at the same time. But let's take things very slowly, one step at a time. So what I want to do with this lesson is begin by introducing you to a problem, and then we're going to solve it without recursion. We're going to solve it in a more traditional way. We're going to use a while loop. And then I'm going to show you how recursion can actually solve this problem in an alternate way. And I think that'll be the best chance for us to introduce ourselves to what recursion is and how it looks like and how it works. So let's say I want to define a function here called count down from count down from, and it's going to take a single argument, which I'm going to give the parameter name of number. So this function is going to be pretty simple. What I want it to do is I want it to count down from a number to one inclusively. So for example, if I give it the argument 10, I want it to print out 10, 9, 8, etc., all the way down to one. If I give it the argument 5, I want it to print 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I wanted to print every number from the number that we passed in as an argument all the way down to and including one. So how might we build this with the stuff that we know so far with our skills? Well, we can use something like a while loop. We can say while this number is greater than zero, keep printing and keep decrementing it by one up until we get to zero. So that solution might look something like this. I could define a variable within my body called start. I'm just going to set it equal to number. And this is basically just going to be a copy or a clone of whatever number we're starting from, just so we don't have to overwrite number, which is the data or the argument that we're getting into the body here. So whatever our number is, I'm going to assign that to a start variable. Then I could put a basic while loop. While this number, which I'm calling start, is greater than zero. There's two things I want to do here, right? I want to print the current value of the number, so I'm going to print start. And then to make sure this while loop doesn't run forever, I need to make sure I decrement start. I need to make sure I reduce it by one so that we can reevaluate the while loop with a different condition. If I keep start the same, start is always going to be greater than zero. The while loop is always going to be true, and we're going to enter into an infinite loop. So what I can do is just do start minus equals one. This is the exact same syntax, by the way, as start equals start minus one. It's just the shorthand subtraction assignment operator. It takes the current value of start, subtracts one, and reassigns that new value back to start, okay? So let's walk through an example. Uh, for example, if I invoke countdown from right here, and let's say I give it the argument five, how is this gonna work? Well, number is gonna be represented by five. We're gonna take the start variable and assign it to the value five. We're then gonna begin our first check here. While five is greater than zero, is that a condition that evaluates to true? 
The answer is yes, it does, it is true. So we're gonna enter the block. We're first gonna print the value of start, which is going to be five at this point. We're then going to decrement or decrease the value of that start variable by one. So we're gonna go from five to four. At this point, we've reached the end of the block. So we're gonna loop back around to the while statement, to the while condition and evaluate it again. At this point, start is equal to four. So we're gonna evaluate is four greater than zero. Once again, we evaluate to another true, which means the while loop is gonna run again, or rather the block associated with that while condition is gonna run again. So we're gonna print start, which is going to be four at this juncture. Then we're gonna decrement start again by one. So we're gonna go from four to three. Then we repeat the logic. We go back to the top. We're gonna to repeat the logic and then start is eventually gonna be three, then two, then start is gonna be one. It's gonna print one. It's gonna decrement start to zero. Then when we come back around to the while loop, start is now equal to zero. Start is as uh, zero is no longer greater than zero. It's equal to it. So this is going to evaluate to false. The while loop evaluating to false means its body or its block is no longer going to run. And then at that point, we reach the end of the countdown from function. So we're done. And throughout this entire process, since we've been printing all of the current values of start as we've decremented them and iterated, we should see the results on the right hand side. So there on the right, you can see five, four, three, two, one as the output from this countdown from function. Okay, so how can I emulate this design using recursion? Let me go ahead and comment out our code on lines one through five. And we're still gonna invoke countdown from below, but I wanna solve it with an alternate implementation. So I'm still gonna define a function called countdown from. It's still gonna take a number, exact same line number one as above. And again, let me re again remind you what recursion is. Recursion is when a function calls itself, right? So. For example, on line number four above, we have the invocation of the print function, which belongs to Python. A function calling itself means somewhere in the body of this countdown from function, we're gonna be invoking countdown from. We're gonna be calling ourselves, okay? So how is that going to work? Let's think about it this way. We know for a fact that we're going to have to print the number, including the number that we get, that we start with. In this case, five is the number that we start with. So let's say I just begin with a basic print function invocation. We know we're gonna print a number. At this point, hopefully this isn't too confusing. We just have a basic function that prints whatever argument we're giving it. Now think about this. If we realize that line number eight is the responsibility or a functionality of the countdown from function, if we were to simply pass countdown from another number and it were to run again and it were to go through the logic on line number eight again, it would also print that number. So I'm gonna write out the code then we're gonna talk about it one more time because it can be very confusing when you see it for the first time. But imagine within the body of this countdown from function on line number nine, I invoked countdown from and I gave it the argument of number minus one. Okay, so let's talk about what's going on here because this is gonna get really, really layered really quickly and get really complex. Let's just talk about this example on line number 11. We're invoking this function with an argument of five. Number is equal to five. So the first time around, I'm gonna put a comment here, number is equal to five and that's what we're going to print, okay? What we're then going to do is we're going to invoke countdown from on line number nine. We're gonna take number, which is five, subtract one from it to get four and invoke countdown from with a value of four as the argument. So what's going to happen is our original invocation of countdown from is still running, but it's basically gonna start this nested function invocation, this internal or layered function invocation, almost like the, uh, the layers of an onion. We keep going deeper and deeper. So we're still running our original countdown from function where number is equal to five, but we're also starting this process of executing countdown from with a number equal to four. So if you uh, kind of forget for a second the invocation with the number five and think about what happens on the one with the number four, well, we're gonna begin this function anew, starting from the top, in this case, line number eight, number is equal to four. So five is gonna print on our first invocation, but in our nested invocation, number is equal to four, so we're going to print four out. Then in that function, we're once again gonna reach line number nine, where we're gonna invoke countdown from with a number one less than the current number argument, which in this case is four. So we're going to invoke countdown from again, but this time around with an argument of three. Then the process begins anew. We enter into another nested function. And by the way, just to reiterate, 
Now we have two nested functions and the ones at the top are still running. So at the very top of this kind of execution context, Python is still waiting to get the countdown from with a number of five executed but because it's waiting on the internal function of countdown from which has an argument of four, which itself is now waiting on an internal function that has countdown from with an argument of three. And the process is gonna continue on and we're gonna get three and then we're gonna get two and so on. It's gonna keep printing the current number and invoking count on from with one number less. If you can think about it for a second, you might see one of the big problems with our current design, and that is that this is going to run forever, right? We're going to enter into an infinite loop because we are gonna always print a number, and it's always gonna be one less than the function above it, but then we're gonna keep invoking another function with one number less, and we're, then we're gonna get to one, zero, the negative numbers, and then start moving towards negative infinity. And eventually our computer will run out of memory and the Python program will crash. So this is a step in the right direction, but currently this will get our program to crash. But the important thing here, even though this isn't functional, is to recognize that on line number nine, that is an example of recursion, right? We are invoking countdown from, from within the definition of countdown from. So how can we solve for this problem? It's actually going to be a pretty simple solution. All we have to do is establish what's called a base case. A base case is just some kind of condition that's going to tell the function it's time to stop running. And the way we do that is with something like a simple if statement. Remember conditionals, if statements, etc. So what we can do is wrap this whole thing in an else, which I'll do in just a second. But at the very top of this function, I'm gonna put an if statement. And I'm gonna say, if my number is equal to zero, in fact, if I want to make this as adaptive as possible, I can even make this less than or equal to zero. That way, if somebody invokes countdown from with something like a negative number, I, I'll know that I won't run into this problem. So I'm gonna say, if the number that I'm currently being passed in as an argument is less than or equal to zero, so any negative number or zero, what I want to do here is just return. The return keyword can be used just by itself. If you use it without anything afterwards, it's just going to return the regular default value of none and the function will be done running. And here what I wanna do is I could wrap this in an else statement, but I don't even need to do that because uh, the if statement can just run by itself. And if the if statement does not execute, the function is gonna continue running down here, right? And it's a basic either or, so I don't need to even wrap this in an else, but you are more than welcome to do it. And this will actually work. So let me go ahead and clear this and execute this. And on the right hand side, you're gonna see we're gonna get the exact same output from our countdown from function, five, four, three, two, one, but we're now using recursion. So let's slow down one more time and talk about what exactly is going on here. Let's begin from the very top. We invoke countdown from on line number 14 with an argument of five for the number parameter. So we begin the invocation of countdown from, this is at the very top level. Number is now equal to five. We begin with our if statement. If number is less than or equal to zero. If five is less than or equal to zero. That is going to evaluate to false. So our if body is not gonna run. We're just gonna hit the return if it did, but we are not gonna run it anyway, which means we're gonna proceed to line number 11 and we're gonna print number five. That's what we see right here on our right-hand side, our very first output. Then we're going to go ahead and invoke countdown from with an argument of four. We're still within the body of our very first execution. We're now creating another nested function context, a nested function invocation. So the nested function where number is equal to four starts running, it starts running from the top. It says if four is less than or equal to zero, that is going to evaluate to false, which means once again, we're not gonna return. We're gonna print four, we see that right here, and we invoke countdown from with number minus one, which is four minus one, which is three. Right? We begin another nested function where count on from is invoked with a number set to three. Once again, we do our comparison. We don't return, we print three, we uh, invoke it with two. This continues all the way down till we get to a number of zero. We're, we're on the last iteration before this, number is equal to one, so we're gonna print one. We see it right here. We then invoke count on from with a argument of zero. One minus one is zero. Now, when we invoke count on from, we're now four or five, however many levels deep. Number is equal to zero. The if statement runs and says, if zero is less than or equal to zero, we finally have a true. When we have a true, we return, which means we never get a chance to hit lines 11 and 12 
on that function uh, invocation where number is equal to zero. That means we can finally start cascading back up all the way to the original function invocation. We go back up to the countdown from invocation where number is equal to one, and the function, uh, the line, line number 12 is satisfied because it's gotten its return value. So it's done. We go back up to the one where number is equal to two. That's done. We go back up to, up to the invocation where number is equal to three. That's done. We go up one more level where number is equal to four. That's done. Then we move up back to the very top invocation where number is equal to five, and that's where it all began. And that's where we started the function invocation of count on from internally. That is now done, so the function is finally done running, and that's what we see on the right hand side. And that's all there is to cover in this lesson on recursion. We're going to tackle recursion one more time in the next lesson. I'm going to take you through another very similar example. This tends to be a very challenging topic, so I want to make sure we understand it. And I provide you with not just one, but two lessons of examples for us to absorb, and then you'll be able to tackle this challenge on your own. But in this lesson, we introduce the concept of recursion. Recursion is a simple idea to describe. It's just when a function invokes itself. Uh, but an incredibly difficult idea to actually implement in action. You have to start thinking across multiple levels or layers of execution. We saw how we can define countdown from with a regular iterative approach with a while loop that is iterating from uh, the number all the way down to a certain number. And then we saw how we could solve the exact same problem using a recursive solution. That's the function that we have on lines number seven and uh, line seven through 12. Specifically, the recursion occurs on line number 12. That's where we invoke countdown from from within the body of countdown from. However, we don't just invoke the original function, we invoke it with a totally different argument, with an argument that is a number that is one less than whatever is the current value of number. And this doesn't just happen once, it happens several times depending on what our initial argument is. If we were to invoke countdown from with let's say 100, we would go into 100 of these nested functions and then cascade all the way back up uh, while Python was printing the value of each one and then calling the function again for one number less. In order to make sure that we don't enter into an infinite loop, every recursive problem or algorithm will require you to establish what's called a base case. We have our base case on lines eight and nine. The base case is some kind of condition that's gonna allow us to stop. If we don't have a base case, if we don't tell Python under what condition we can stop, then we can continue this recursive process forever until the program eventually runs out of memory due to the infinite loop. I know this is very complex, but I hope the general gist or idea of what we're doing here uh, has kind of been explained well enough for you to understand. So again, in the next lesson, we're gonna take a look at one more example, and then I'll leave you to it to challenge yourself on, with this on your own. Remember, it is not critical to master this to understand Python. I just wanted to make sure you were exposed to this kind of thinking because it's gonna pop up a lot in interviews, and it's just a good introduction to some of the more complex challenges of programming. It's a lot easier to teach you how to use print to output something to the screen. This is the part where we start to see some of the actual, you know, uh, myths, if you will, or at least the media representations of programming come to life. This is the part where you might be grasping your head and saying, wow, this is really deep. I have to think a lot. This is for smart people. It's these kinds of problems uh, that require you to start thinking across all these different dimensions and keeping track of more than one thing at a time in memory. That's what makes it so tough and challenging. But I trust that you're up to the challenge and I will see you in the next lesson.